So maybe on BitChute, you see one of these pasted responses or comments, which indicate that you should have a whole lot of kids. And that's a good idea. And especially references something like the Amish demographic and how that can be a majority in the future down the line because they have a particularly high birth rate. Or maybe you've seen something similar within a video. Maybe you've just instinctually known that it's a really good idea to have a higher birth rate. And especially in Western countries, we could really use those higher birth rates right now for our people. And that at least for one thing eliminates the necessity that these businesses are currently having for migrant workers. And I know that that's not ideal. That shouldn't be the goal. And it's an unfeeling aspect of our modern economy, which has no real interest in preserving any sort of culture. It just is there. But that is what we're dealing with right now. So this is at least potentially part of the solution, part of the solution to far larger problems. And it's something that we could do easily. But this made me think to myself, what are the implications if we're looking at the Amish in particular and how big should this family actually be? So I just wanted to take some quick notes on that and get an idea of what would be ideal for starting a large family, especially in terms of Amish. Well, that's part of my ancestry. I still have some family in the Amish community. So hopefully I can be your semi-tech savvy guide through this conundrum, the Amish question. So first I just wanted a comparison and I found that the highest fertility in the world in a national context is Niger, which has a fertility rate of 6.95 births per woman. This is lower than their 2019 rate of 7.27 births per woman. Now, Niger's high fertility rate have resulted in consistently young populations where the median age is 15.2 years old. And that means right now they're growing at a crazy fast rate. However, there's a still a lot of instability in Africa and Niger in general. So we won't necessarily expect them to grow as quickly as the Amish community, especially when we look at the Amish community and that they on some years actually have a higher birth rate than that. So. What I found here is that seven is commonly given as the average number of children for the Amish in some settlements. However, it may be closer to six and in others, it can reach eight or nine. So a couple key takeaways. The good news is that yes, Amish families are the largest average families in the world most years, meaning that these people are modern white people living in the environment of America itself and are mainly of German descent. So the idea that our environment or our genetics alone is lowering our fertility is not true. Second, the economics can be there to have such a family size, even in modern day America. It's just fundamentally changing how your economy works, how you live, if you can. These people, after all, generate far less money than you do. Third, in comparison to countries with similar birth rates, the Amish population has far longer life expectancy and far better stability. And their growth is faster right now, but they are starting from a much smaller population than these other countries. From my knowledge, these people have a tendency to live on to their 90s. Again, they don't really have crime, murder, too many medical issues. So their population growth is faster than African countries with similar birth rates. And from this health, this fertility within the American environment, we can get some fertility tips and just compare to how the Amish live. So fertility begins to gradually decline at around age 32 in women. Starting between 35 and 37, fertility begins to drop more quickly. And other factors may reduce your chances of getting pregnant, including smoking, cancer treatments such as radiation and chemotherapy, pelvic infection, Starting at age 35, these pregnancy risks become more common. Gestational diabetes, high blood pressure, preeclampsia, placenta previa, miscarriage, premature birth, stillbirth, need for cesarean delivery, heavy bleeding after delivery, infant low birth weight, chromosomal abnormalities such as Down syndrome. Other fertility health tips get to a healthy weight. An ideal body mass index is between 19 and 24. Being overweight or underweight can affect your ability to ovulate. 
quit smoking. And of course, the Amish do not smoke. Smoking can damage your egg supply and make you more likely to miscarry if you do get pregnant. Also, watch your diet. Eating a high-fat diet can contribute to weight gain and disrupt your reproductive cycle. Limit caffeine and alcohol. Research has linked excess amounts of caffeine, more than two or three cups of coffee daily, with miscarriage. Frequent alcohol use can prolong the time it takes you to get pregnant and is harmful to fetal development. So all this together sounds very positive for two groups in particular, the Amish and the Mormons. This matches the customs for both, and maybe this does tell us a little bit of how both of these groups are living in modern-day America, are very white, have very high fertility rates, and actually, from what we can tell right now, these groups aren't just doing fine, they're doing great in terms of health down to a certain amount of eugenics that is going on positively for both. Import American Mormons. Yeah, maybe we should import some more Mormons. Maybe we can convert some, maybe we should make Mormon the state religion of Denmark and uh, we can uh, go more in that direction. Um, I don't know. I I actually own, I, I know one Mormon. There is one Mormon IQ researcher, in fact, uh, Russell Warren, uh, who is quite good at this stuff. So he tells me somehow he can reconcile the science with his Mormon belief, which makes no sense to me, but I'm very happy that he can do this. Uh, but Mormons is one of the only, is that Mormons is the only known Western population that has a eugenic uh, fertility pattern such that the smarter people and the more educated people have more kids. Um, I, I, no one has studied the Amish. I don't know if they also have this, but possibly. So maybe there is a kind of, maybe the way that religiousness works to kind of boost IQs of countries is that it creates eugenic fertility patterns. Maybe, yeah. maybe that is one way. And I also wanted to add this Amish maternal age chart here. Now, it's interesting. So actually having children at 20 and under, fairly rare in the Amish community. But 20 to 24, that's a nice sweet spot, especially for having a lot of the initial children. And then 25, 29, good period too. It definitely starts to slow down by 30 and over. And you can see that there's a large drop off, especially as you get into the 40s. So it's not really worth waiting. Best time, certainly for this size of family, is to start in your early 20s. And then working off of this chart, for the seven children estimate commonly given for Amish families, even with the presence of genetic defects removing some from reproducing, these defects are still far too rare to significantly slow the population increase of the Amish. The growth rate I found for the Amish is a doubling of population every 18 to 20 years. That's very helpful to think about, isn't it? Right now in America, white people are expected to be a minority in just around 20 years, and for most European nations, there's more time than that, though the nations closest behind right now and in horrible demographic situations are Ireland and France. But in America, we expect a white population minority in about 20 years, and that's running at the same time with projections of only a 10% population growth in that time. However, we all know it's likely to change faster than that, and thanks to illegal immigration, millions can add a big spike to that population. But generally, what do we expect really in the resulting population growth by that time? Will it actually be an effective growth of 15% or 20%, something you know, way up than the projected growth, if we count in the illegal immigration? So, certainly, yes, if all white Americans woke up today and decided that we're going to be conservative and have tons of kids, we could outbreed the legal and illegal immigration rates combined by a long shot. Since that's not realistic, though, the point is that, at least even with immigrant populations, white conservatives can independently grow at a rate of almost doubling every 20 years. And we can do this if you're ready to say, screw the consequences and live in an affordable area with family first. But the big tricks are getting women started young enough, certainly that 20, 24 in that range. And even men should be reasonably young as the sperm will start to carry mutations also. And of course, dealing with a government that hates us for existing is another big wrench in this plan. But we'll see how that goes. Now, as I started out in my explanation, I just sort of kind of know the Amish. Um, I don't really know too much about the Mormons, so I know their customs. 
I've researched a bit more about their customs in general for some of my recent videos, but I can't really say exactly what's going on there for a eugenics purpose. I could compare it in the terms of customs and say for the Amish, if we looked into them, what we would expect to see is people marrying very young. They have a great community in general, which has them coming together. I remember uh, Dr. Dutton here did do a video on marry your third cousin. And of course, the Amish community is coming from way back on a couple different family trees. You can indirectly pass on your genes um, as a, a K strategy, as a, a slow life strategy person, um, at the level of the group, i.e. by investing in your ethnic group, your extended kinship group. And this can include saving that group from peril by laying down your life for it. Now, similarly, people that are in this kind of situation will select um, uh, for, for people, will be sexually attracted to people who are uh, genetically uh, uh, similar to them because they are evolved if you are a, a slow history strategist remember it's a predictable and harsh environment so you are very specifically evolved to that environment and so the thing to do is to select for other people who are very specifically evolved to that environment as well because then your children will be more likely to survive in that environment so people who are a K strategist slow history strategist will select not for people that are very different from them but you know but, but good looking but people who aren't necessarily that good looking they'll trade that for people who are very similar to them and who therefore will survive in that environment and therefore their children will survive in that predictable ecology that is not going to change and so for all these reasons slow life history strategy people will be interested in people who are and also if you're you'll bond more strongly you're with them your marriage will be more last a uh, lot longer lasting your genes will be more compatible which will also mean, because you, 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 you get this idea of inbreeding depression. If you're too similar to somebody, then you're more likely to have double doses of harmful genes. But this falls off a cliff once you go beyond, and Pinger admits this, once you go beyond cousin, um, and once you go beyond that, then your genes are more compatible. They haven't been separated for a long time. And so complex polygenic traits are more likely to work. And so therefore, people like that, people who are group selected, interested in the good of their group, their ethnic group, whatever, will tend to go for people that are relatively genetically similar to them. I, and the best thing to do is either your third cousin or the equivalent which is about one point, if you think that you're 50% related to your parents and you're 25% to your grandparents and so on, um, your third cousin, so that is somebody with whom you sh share a set of great, great grandparents, um, who is just outside, I think. A lot of people would regard, yeah, my cousin, that's my family. Even some of my second cousins, I knew, I know them personally, that's my family. I, do, I, do you know any of your third cousins? Do you know personally any of your third cousins? I certainly don't. I couldn't name a third cousin. I don't know the names of any of my third cousins. Third cousin being your grandfather's or grandmother's cousin's grandchildren. Um, I, I don't know any such people. So that's just outside family. And that seems to be, according to this research in Iceland, the sweet spot. More related, and there's problems from, you know, double doses of mutant genes or whatever. Less related, uh, and there's problems. So this could actually be what's working out, that they're having particularly viable offspring because they're not at all mixed race. They're actually of just a couple different lineages. So you have a very simple, very pure lineage coming out of there, and you're going to have the pairing of third cousins or so. The other thing I sort of went over in my initial video but didn't really explain in full detail was the issue of inbreeding in this sort of strategy. Certainly, what I would generally propose is genetic similarity from parent to child. And there's plenty of studies that show that that's a good thing. But the question is, how close should those similarities be between the two parents? And in the case of the Amish, it seems to be too close right now. There are some issues that they're running into. So this inbreeding can be the result of a closer relationship than third cousins. And yes, in some communities, you will get marriages of second cousins. But we would have to clarify one aspect that Dutton is working with here. That when he says that this genetic similarity marriage tends to be the sweet spot at third cousins, it is a tends to be statement. He's working with averages. So what he's saying, based on his reference research papers in this video, may be true. 
but true to the extent of averages. So one issue to keep in mind as you watch his video, and yes, it was a controversial video of his in the first place, uh, is that the level of genetic similarity or difference between a couple is not a guarantee of birth defects. What determines the presence of birth defects is not the overall percentage similarity. It's the shared presence of particular genes that cause these defects. That's how you can get rare birth defects from couples who are further apart genetically. And in contrast, a couple that is too different, mainly if we say of different races, then the child has such an elevated likelihood of drug abuse, mental problems, and the relationship itself is likely to fall apart and or have the highest rates of abuse on average. And even some studies are indicating that with this genetic distance between child and parent, that the parent-child bond would be particularly weak. So Dutton's statements still seem on average true, that we do not want couples of people too genetically different. But some Amish communities do have a problem, where they are at present crossing the threshold of being too similar even if their marriages might typically be in the sweet spot of third cousin marriage, roughly speaking. This illustrates one thing that Dutton himself doesn't clarify, and that's the starting population size for this strategy and how long a limited population can sustain themselves before genetic issues start to show up significantly. Let me illustrate this for the Amish. So the graph we have here is a demonstration for how inbreeding can work in certain controlled populations, that each generation in such a community, the inbreeding level increases as a result of the relationships. Basically, it's just the continual pairing within this community, which means the community is going to share more and more genes each generation. And some pairings increase the rate of inbreeding faster than others, making some populations less inbred for a longer period of time, as you can see in the lower line versus the N20 line. So for the Amish, they've had these close marriages. They've been forming American communities since the early 1700s, and from that origin to today, modern Amish and Mennonites across the U.S. are descended from fewer than 200 families. However, it's worth noting that really it's quite rare for members of one Amish or Mennonite community to move to another community. That sort of move mainly comes with leaving the church. So the individual Amish communities descend from only a portion of those less than 200 original families, which account for all of these different communities together. Now, this tells us something positive and negative, that the model for greater inbreeding with generations after several hundred years is having an effect, and we are seeing inbreeding diseases turn up the last couple of decades. However, these effects still depend on the pairing, on the presence of particular genes in a couple. And this actually means that right now we're not seeing the same genetic defects in some Amish communities as others. And some Amish communities actually are still doing fairly well. This is one of the reasons that I hadn't thought to expand on some specifics of inbreeding in the Amish community the first time I released this video. Because the community I know personally doesn't have these issues at present. Actually at present, I would be coming from a particularly lucky stock location-wise and in terms of family history, I likely have these discovered genes that give some Amish a lot of longevity and defense against diabetes. From that, the longevity is present in some Amish communities, and the genes that protect against diabetes seem to be even more common. However, that's just the positive stuff. I know that you're looking at the inbreeding out of curiosity, and if we are to look at an Amish life strategy for ideas and forming a better future, then we do need to identify the problem there and possible solutions so that we can copy their habits from marriage to health and make very successful families. So for issues in particular Amish communities, there's maple syrup urine disorder, which can result in infant death, but has some treatments. It was observed in Ohio communities among old order Mennonites at a one to 380 incident rate in that community. Ohio and Pennsylvania communities have had Cohen syndrome, and that's very rare having several dozen cases found in these communities, but scientists think there are only 100 to 1,000 cases of this worldwide. Then there's Amish lethal microcephaly, only among the old order Amish people in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, at the rate of 1 in 500 births. And there's 
Krigler-Nager syndrome with 110 cases worldwide, and from that, 20% of those cases are among the Amish and Mennonites. At present, the proposed solution to Amish genetic defects is gene splicing or stem cells, which, to my surprise, they are somewhat receptive to as an idea. Not that they generally understand what these technologies entail. But this does make sense as some researchers and medical professionals have been working very closely with the Amish who have these genetic defects, and the success of these practices seems to have gained enough trust by this point that the Amish community would be willing to engage in genetic splicing or stem cell research. Another strategy is to map out the genetics of Amish communities, identify the defects as they have been doing with smaller samples, and use that in identifying hazardous and non-hazardous marriages within these communities. Another simpler, cheaper method is to introduce people outside the Amish community, but this idea is actually not welcome. My idea to this, which seems plain given what I've read so far on the Amish community specific genetic defects, would be to encourage Amish from one community to move to another community, as that is rarely done and would reinvigorate the community genetics with a different part of the tree that are at this point many generations distant, and we do know have different enough genetics by now. The bottom line is that despite Amish marriages typically following Dutton's suggested genetic distance, the Amish are limited by the founder effect, and that they've made it this far, this successfully, and even exhibiting some great genetics in the average population after 300 years of this close marriage in these communities speaks to Dutton's statements being true up until these marriages just occur too much for too many generations. And that's what's been appearing now in the Amish for several decades and will worsen as they remain too closed off. So if we just started marrying third cousins today, and especially if we did it starting out with good genes and Amish habits, we could be okay for, let's say, 100, 200 years. And then even we can completely avoid this second cousin marriage that might have occurred in the Amish past, and we don't know how long that this strategy could work then before we run into any problems at all. But who knows what it will be like in over 100 years. At present, we could use gene splicing to get around the problems. And of course, we could opt for people who are genetically further off than third cousins. Again, you don't want to go too far off. We know that relationships of huge genetic differences tend to be bad relationships, less family bonding, all on average. So if for our strategies we want to say third cousin is just too close, fifth or sixth cousin genetic equivalent is the actual sweet spot that we want then, then that would work and that genetic difference is likely to be greater than the genetic variation within the Amish community. So certainly, white people in general and in contrast to the Amish have more than enough diversity to make long-term successful populations. But if we could benefit from the Amish old age or anti-diabetes genes, those are some nice benefits. And likely we'll find those also in German or Swiss populations. So especially if you have such an ancestry there, basically being an Aryan, uh, best to find another Aryan to make healthy kids with. And my conclusion on the Amish inbreeding subject is that it is having an effect. However, it is an effect that at present we do have tools to work around and certainly it does not hurt to find someone who is genetically similar to you but genetically further off in relationship than a third cousin equivalent and there's no doubt that we can learn from the Amish they are still very healthy people on average so no doubt no doubt at all that for our goals we can learn something from their practices and adapt it to make it even better for your health, for having a large family. Now, otherwise, it is worth noting that there's a tendency for people to have lower birth rates within a more comfortable nation or a nation with greater density once the population gets high enough. So more stability, more education, and then more density. All of these can account for how many people come to Western nations from high birth rate nations, but their birth rates then decrease though without being subjected to the same propaganda as our population and with some greater support they do have higher birth rates but take for example say what happens to latin americans when they come up here 
not as high of birth rates as we expected. It hasn't stayed as high. It's dropped significantly. So slowing down there. Now, in terms of the Western people already, this is one advantage and disadvantage that we've looked at for a long time. The liberals, the anti-white whites, especially will have few children. The conservatives, Christians will have more children. So the strategy of white people embracing white positive attitudes in the home and also having more children could pay off on the same assumptions as the assumption that we do have time to have several generations. If given this time, yes, then white people will maintain more conservative tendencies while the liberal tendencies die with their white adherents. Given the current trend of political persecution, though, the heat is on towards an intentionally dangerous end goal, and achieving such a high birth rate will become especially difficult given the added challenges we face. Keep in mind that we are starting from a very large disadvantage in terms of our modern day population compared to the modern population of the rest of the world. And in particular, we need to understand that if we engage in this, we will be increasing density. And if we look at places like India, China, where they have such a high density as a result of their particularly high populations, you do realize that we will see more competition for resources and more pollution. The best scenario depends on awakening white liberals and getting what few babies they can make with their wombs after a master's degree. But more likely in this scenario, conservatives are benefited by the dying off of these white anti-whites. And as such, conservatives are required to pick up that added slack. And thus, the effect of white population in America, the white population in America that we would want to nourish is already a national minority. For the fertile generation right now, we're looking at something like 30% of young people who might be conservative and white. And the younger that people are when they decide to have this larger family, the better. At present, conservatives certainly have children younger and more children. But for the number of births I quoted, seven as ideal, it's competitive and it's achievable, though it is high. We're hoping for women with their minds set up on such a goal around 25 at the latest and pumping out babies once a year before that 32 even hits. Some flexibility there, of course, a bit later or a bit earlier, and the earlier is certainly preferred, as I said. So think of it this way, just in terms of the ideal numbers. If we start at 18 in terms of legality and getting out of high school as a benefit, then you have seven years before 25 for having those seven babies, or you have seven years after 25 before you hit 32, and so in total you get 14 ideal childbearing years before you hit that 32 for those seven kids. So one kid every two years is another way of ideally getting those seven kids that we would want. However, along the way, what you'd want to avoid is alcoholic drinking, which is something that's encouraged in college, You'd want to avoid smoking, which is unfortunately still encouraged in some parts of college, certainly in Europe. You'd want to avoid coffee, which is quite a female-centric social culture right now. So all of these things are kind of weaponized against your womb and advertised to you. But realistically, where we are now, we would need two things. Our government to not seek methods of halting our reproduction and we would need the resources to continue population expansion while vying for space and resources with other growing populations. Given these two assumptions together, what would you want to bet that our government would be willing to create a child restriction, copying China in the name of the environment, or even more openly hostile to us, they could create such a child restriction while continuing immigration. We also would ultimately be accepting lower income lower education, only the man of the house would be making money for many of these years, or in one scenario, we could be more dependent on government support. However, something to note, reshuffling the economy now demographically really has us questioning how much do they want to balance their budget. It's certainly not balanced realistically, massively in debt, but in our current demographics, we have many ethnic populations dependent on mostly the tax dollars of white people. We also get tax surpluses from wealthier demographics, East Asians and Indians. So reshuffling the economy to remove white people 
could mean different things. If high paying jobs are mainly given instead to Indians, East Asians, and Ashkenazis, then this would currently require importing far more of them than Hispanics. If the economy is more seriously inverted relative to current average incomes, then you would have black people and Hispanics pushed into high paying roles and paying more taxes. In terms of birth rate, that would actually be ideal for our people if the benefits worked similarly for our people, though I'm not going to hold my breath on that. From the trends I'm seeing in CEO positions, I think the Asian Indian Ashkenazi import option is what we're getting already. And those populations can be imported at an accelerated rate now to compensate for the increase of Hispanic and African laborers or dependents. Looking at the Amish model right now, they have several problems where their demographic expansion cannot continue much longer. For them, they're running out of resources, especially land. Largely, farmers in general have been forced to either sell off their land or divide it up to their children. In the case of the Amish, it has been dividing up land into smaller and smaller plots. You can see several problems. Without the income needed, they cannot at present buy new plots of land. And that means there's a density and resources challenge that they're confronting already. Now, their self-sufficiency could work out long term, only in the case of the U.S. population actually shrinking. And given overall birth rates, that could happen if not for immigration. If not for immigration, that would have been the natural decline of crazy leftism, the end of feminism in general. But living where we do now, population is still growing. So there's no opportunity for cheap land. And that's the intention, of course. It's exactly as the wealthy want it to be, everything more expensive, more competition for resources. The other way that the Amish demographic could work out is mass starvation, mass sterilization, total economic collapse, etc. outside the Amish community. However, judging from history, it is not good to be a farmer while other people are starving. If such a population shrinking were to happen quickly rather than slowly and naturally, then these people would simply not stand a chance. As I said, they have no means or will to defend themselves, so they would be slaughtered. So I'm thinking for stability and as a solution to ensure that this strategy pays off to preserve white people, this is something that will be most successful if applied in areas where we can grow easily. Cities yet unbuilt in the North Slavic countries, some South American countries, especially Uruguay, the key will be ensuring that you can have a government, media, and education system which is not anti-white. At minimum, a government that is ready to apply pressure to the other two to ensure no anti-white messages. And if we were in such a nation as to have that, then we would be having a surplus of children. Which is one thing I've thought of, especially in terms of the Slavic countries that can be doing this now, can be doing it hopefully fairly comfortably and actually have a surplus that they can send to other uh, European countries. Though, in the most prominent Western nations, we do not have any governments close to what I'm describing. So, yeah, it's unpredictable, but absolutely, having a larger family, in general, it is a great positive action, and one that we can, at present, do for our future. Especially if our children can grow up with the strength of thought that we can give them. And the younger generations will be far better as the liberal order just dies off. It's also very fun to make babies. I know we're all concerned right now, but no matter where you are in the world, what do you have to lose there? Especially women. This is a great thing that only you can do. We don't need you to get in the streets, get into fights, or working your youth away. So taking on the role of mother to so many children is such a beautiful thing to do. It's worth far more long term than our quest for wealth. It's our greed, our old comforts have led us exactly to where we are. No money, no TV. No drug is worth living under a government that wants us to be harmed in every way that they can. So, while I might be blackpilled on some aspects of the world as it is right now, Western nations and the absolute suicide that they're going through, well, some nations do have more time than others before they become a minority within their own country, and some nations have better governments, better systems of government than others, which will allow for a significant change, I hope. And certainly, no matter what, this is just a positive thing that you can do. And it's obviously better than doing nothing, so being a good, truly conservative person as you are 
get out there and make seven beautiful children in a nice area. Now we're standing at the portals